Hello, everyone. We're here at the Science and Technology Convergence Conference 2022, organized by the Catalyst Foundation, which is an initiative of SmartGate VC. Um, EVN Report was the media partner of the conference. I'm here with Liana Garapetian, an associate at SmartGate and one of the organizers of the conference. Liana, tell us a little bit about um, what the overall objective and the goal of, uh, of the conference was. Hi, Nishte. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, highlighting the um, STCC conference. And it was a great pleasure to have EVN report as part of our partners for uh, Science and Technology Convergence Conference. Actually, this conference was first initiated by the Institute of Informatics and Automation Problems. They have been doing this, I think, four times. Uh, we joined forces with them first in 2018. That was still a small-scale uh, conference. Uh, a bigger one was held in 2019. And then we didn't do it uh, the last two years because of COVID, the war. We're kind of back with the conference uh, with a bigger scale. This time we had more speakers, like 80 plus speakers. We had uh, 50 plus uh, discussions, both individual presentations and panel discussions. Uh, and then I think we will like summarize the numbers uh, very soon. But I think we had over uh, 1,000 people coming and going during this uh, two-day period. Uh, the goal of the conference was converging science and technology, and I would add to this uh, the industry, because the goal was to connect people both in academia and the industry, p uh, companies that have in-house research, academic institutions, have a place where everyone can meet and new partnerships could rise from there. We had a case uh, out, of our, um, uh, out of STCC 2019 when a new company was created, which was Biosim. Uh, there was a case where uh, two people repatriated to Armenia and they started their own labs. I mean, we, of course, we also have our incentive of uh, generally advancing the tech uh, and scientific ecosystem in Armenia and because uh, Catalyst Foundation is the organizer and it is an initiative smart gate VC we also are very much uh, inclined into being uh, in, into creating new companies uh, and where smart gate can eventually invest in but that's not like the sole purpose uh, of the conference it's more about bringing people together, and not only locally, the main point was bringing people from uh, outside of Armenia. The majority of the speakers, I would say, were diaspora and Armenians, but we did have uh, speakers uh, who were not Armenians, uh, either are somehow connected to Armenia, like they already work with different companies here, or uh, no connection with Armenia. We just right. invited them. We wanted because their experience was somehow very relevant to the topics discussed. We sent the invitation. We're happy to get uh, an approval. Um, so the idea was really converging science and technology, uh, industry and academia, and also understanding what are our next steps. I would say rebuilding and advancing science in Armenia because if we're talking about technology, AI, machine learning, we do have some community here. So the question uh, um, under the discussions was about what's our next step here. If we're talking about biotech, for example, we had discussions on a couple panel discussions on uh, the emerging biotech sector in Armenia. When we talk about this, there isn't really much ecosystem here. Uh, not much research happening here. Uh, no scientific community. I mean. I, would, I don't say no, but very little scientific community. Another uh, lineup of uh, discussions on space research. Right. Um, and in these areas, we're very, very new. Like, there's a lot to be done. And the question under the discussions was about uh, what should be the major catalyst? Like, you can't do everything at once. So we wanted to understand, along with the speakers invited, uh, sharing their ideas, we wanted to understand uh, what should we do yeah. like in the first place? Where we should start, where, where we already have some expertise that we should double down on in order to have some capacity in the next few years, because there's definitely a very long game. There is a lot to be done. The topic under the discussions of these uh, topic areas was what should be our next step, like uh, where we have the resources that we should double down on, uh, and where do we have some capacity that we can improve upon. Um, so the, the, there was different lines of discussions or sections of discussion and each of them had a, a, some kind of a theme uh, under it. Like we had a poster session area where uh, people could present their work and others, uh, the speakers, the audience, could just walk around and see what these people are doing in their labs or in their companies. Mm -hmm. um, 
Otherwise, you would you are probably uh, working on your own work, and you don't know what uh, others are doing. Right. And when you see, uh, you kind of start thinking about, hmm, maybe there is some collaboration opportunity right. there, or maybe I know someone who could be uh, a, a fit for the resort, could help somehow. So yeah, to cut it short, uh, it's more about uh, giving the the platform the opportunity to meet people, and also meet people uh, of higher profile, people who have already gone through this process, and they can. Uh, guide uh, the starting scientists or starting entrepreneurs uh, yeah. in their ventures. Yeah. I'll just share a little bit from my perspective. It was my first time attending the, the conference. I wasn't here in, in the past years when it was happening. Um, the thing that was really impressive for me was, one, that there was a really good mix of both local people and people from abroad, both diaspora and Armenians, but also just non-Armenians who were interested in doing something in the sector here. And the other thing that was really impressive was how many different verticals were covered throughout the conference. There was space tech, there was IoT stuff, there was machine learning, there was a lot of biotech, hardware engineering, and stuff. Um, so uh, as a part of our coverage here, we'll be launching sort of a mini podcast series over the next two months that will um, be conversations with some of the guests of the conference. We'll also be writing uh, about the conference and that article should be published soon. And lastly, just tell people what's next for the conference. Uh, how can they keep up with when it will be next year and maybe how can they participate? We're trying to keep it annual, uh, and September, October has been uh, the, this conference period previously, so I very much hope we'll had, have another one uh, next year around uh, this time of the year. Um, and ways to be involved, definitely reach out to us. Uh, we're always happy to hear from people who are interested to engage with Armenia, share their expertise. Um, people, of course, in this space, I mean, someone in arts or culture, they, they approach me, I wouldn't probably be able to help them. But people in the space of te technology, science, entrepreneurship, uh, we at Catalyst Foundation and SmartGate VC, which um, initiated the foundation, uh, we're always looking for more and more people, Armenians and not only, uh, to connect and to, to become the link between uh, the locals, uh, people who need this expertise, and those who can provide that. Right. It's not that, I mean, we come to this ecosystem uh, as investors, and support hands for building a company. But we also kind of take on this uh, initiative of community management, so to say, like uh, uh, the organization that unites people together. And so we're always happy uh, to um, connect. Uh, another thing is that uh, the idea of converging science, technology, academia industry is not uh, a job for a one-time conference or one-time event. It's more of an ongoing process. Uh, we, already, we also uh, like, um, initiated this um, science and technology convergence platform, which is just that, the conference translated into an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, within this initiative, we have been talking to different, uh, again, scientists, entrepreneurs, technology people, uh, and making these connections with the local people. And so anyone interested it's always a good time to connect. Uh, it's not about September, October. It's not about the STCC dates. It, it's an ongoing process, and we're happy to, yeah. uh, to meet new people and make connections right. with Armenia. Okay, Liana, thank you so much. And now we'll get to our, our first guest of the podcast series. Thank you, Liana. We're going to launch the series today with Professor Mergi Papazian, who was the president of San Jose State University. She's currently the executive in residence at San Jose State. We spoke about the role of the university in 2022, how it has evolved, and how we can work to develop our higher education system and university ecosystem in Armenia. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you'll stay tuned with us over the next few weeks as we roll out this series of podcasts from the conference. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Papazian, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here, Nishef. Yeah. Thank you. I'm really excited to have you here today because when, we're going to get the perspective of someone who's worked in the university system as an executive. Um, often we hear the perspective of scientists, uh, which you yourself have been an academic, but I think your, your perspective as an executive is going to be really interesting for us. Let's start with the role of the university in, in 2022. I know it's a bit of a, a broad question, but how do you see it? Because I feel like often in, at times it's being challenged by these new 
forms of education, a post-secondary education. How do you see the role of the university in, in the modern day? Well, I think the university is an important stakeholder. It may not be the only space, but it's a place where you can bring people together uh, from from students who are uh, really asking questions and seeking, I think, experiences that allow them to have impact uh, with faculty who are asking some big questions and focusing, I think, their research potentially in areas that advance the conversation around some of these questions, uh, but also who are engaged uh, with the students through the teaching mission. And I think there has to be a really strong connection between the research mission of a university and the teaching mission. I'm a big supporter of the teacher-scholar model uh, because I think in the 21st century especially, we're living in an age when information is at our fingertips. This is very different than when I grew up in the 20th century, and um, we had to learn from, if you will, the sage on the stage. Now it's really about um, thinking through how what we know can come together to find creative and innovative ways to solve problems, to gain deeper understanding, to build the kind of civic leaders uh, who have a broad understanding. I think the beauty of a university is it brings all the disciplines together. So you have your scientists, but you also have your social scientists. You have your individuals from the humanities who ask different questions. They're the dot connectors, if you will. I mean, we talk about soft skills. It's not my favorite term because they're used to asking questions about, about meaning, um, really seeing where humanity fits into some of the more technical kinds of things. And so I, I think universities have, have a critical role to play, but I think at the same time we have to understand that with the change in skills and the lifespan of skills today uh, and the increasing demand for skill-based um, uh, employees, for example, in businesses, uh, that it's important to have a collaboration uh, between these micro-credentials that happen outside the university yeah. and what happens in the university. And the last comment I'd make is that um, we really believe in lifelong learning. And so universities have to think about their role, not just in the traditional four years of an undergraduate education and perhaps the next five years of a graduate education, but really how it impacts um, a, an individual throughout their life. One of the things I've always admired about the American uh, university system is that it's really built this sort of phenomenon of a complete experience. And often when people talk about not going to college, they talk about missing out on the quote-unquote college experience. And I've always seen that as something that is very unique to the U.S. Outside of the U.S., I often see universities as much more of a strictly education center. Is there something about universities in the U.S., maybe it's just the campuses or it's the fact that most people live on campus, that really builds that that experience that is that you can only get at college? Well, the American um, higher education system is very complex. There are many different um, kinds of institutions that make up that ecosystem. Yeah. And uh, a very small percentage, actually, are the small liberal arts colleges where you have traditional age students who live on campus. It's under 20%. I think really? that it's somewhere between 15 and 17%, right? Most students are com going to larger institutions, uh, usually they're state-supported inst uh, institutions or public institutions, right. and they may be traditional age, um, but they are probably um, uh, older than we think. They are probably holding down jobs, perhaps multiple jobs. So they're not living in the bubble, if you will, of the university. They're really um, involved in far more complex um, circumstances of life. Right. And, and so I, I think um, we too often think about the you know, the idealized or, or traditional model, yeah. but, but really higher education is um, drawing on the experiences of students who are engaged in all kinds of things. And I think that's one of its strengths. It's the diversity of it. It's the fact that students are coming from all kinds of backgrounds. They're facing all kinds of challenges and they're bringing that to the table. Yes. And I think we do well when we find ways to actually empower those students to bring their lived experiences into the conversations that take place on the campus or in the classroom. Let's talk a little bit about where the model of the university fits in, in Silicon Valley. So uh, San Jose is in the greater Bay Area. Um, and yesterday in speaking with a colleague, uh, he said something really interesting. He said, it's not that uh, Stanford and Berkeley and these great schools happen to be in the Valley. It's that the Valley was really built around them. 
Um, can you speak a little bit about the importance of strong universities for Silicon Valley and for any tech ecosystem? Yeah, I, I use the example and I, I um, really modeled it after what we know in North Carolina, where there is something called a research triangle. And you have three types of institutions that make that up. You have your uh, elite private institution, Duke. You have your land grant or pu large public research institution in University of North uh, Carolina, um, Chapel Hill. And then you have your public applied, if you will, state university in North Carolina State. And it's that combination, that ecosystem that brings all the different experiences together in one place, which creates a synergy um, of, of experiences that, that I think create not just pure research, but really important applied research yeah. that ask different questions. Now, if you think of Silicon Valley, it's a similar kind of thing. I don't call it the research triangle. I call it the innovation triangle. And it, it can't just be Stanford and, and Berkeley. Stanford, your private elite institution, uh, an amazing place with amazing minds. Uh, at all levels. Berkeley, the land-grant institution in, in the state of California. That's a, that's a straight line. It's two-dimensional. Yeah. You have to come down to the South Bay to San Jose State, which is your um, state university. And it's that ecosystem because what is within that triangle is Silicon Valley. And it took all of that. Um, Gordon Moore, everybody talks about the founder, right, the, of Moore's Law, the fact that the chip speed doubles, right, every so, you know, so many, so many years. Yes. He actually started his education at San Jose State. And, of course, he founded Intel. Um, he went on to Berkeley and Caltech. But um, the, the employee line it, and really bringing those different experiences, I think, creates a synergy and there's something called the geography of jobs. There's a book called The Geography of Jobs, which really talks about that, which is how by bringing these different universities together with the different emerging companies, you're creating um, synergies and opportunities for different kinds of conversations that ultimately drive innovation and have built this incredible global center that we know as Silicon Valley. When we speak about um, developing universities specifically, um, often the conversation moves towards advancing the scientific sector and things like that. But if we narrow it down specifically to strengthening universities, improving the quality of education that our students here in Armenia get, what is your perspective as an executive looking at that? What are some areas that the Armenian university ecosystem needs to focus on? Well, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about how to think about higher education uh, here in Armenia. And I always want to make sure that the voices of people here who are involved with it are, are really at the table in a meaningful way. It's uh, always a little dangerous to come from the outside and to say a, a different system somehow will work here. I'm not sure that's true, but I do think we have different experiences and certainly the European universities is another space where there are some really important best practices yeah. and, and models that, that should be considered. But I would say this, I think um, the one thing I would, I, I would like to see more of here, and I, I know many people are talking about it, we're talking about it at this, uh, at this conference as well, um, is more of an engagement and a connection between the universities, between the universities and the research institutes, to recognize that science is important, but it's only a part of it, that you still need your um, behavioral scientists, your social scientists, uh, your humanists, because they bring different questions to the table. Right. I think, for example, we talk about cybersecurity. It's just one example, really an important piece of technology and security. But the biggest weakness, the biggest area of threat is about human behavior. Right. That's that's the weak that's yeah. the weak link. You can find technologies to protect about uh, on a lot of other things. That's where you need your psychologists at the table. So the most um, important teams are the teams that bring all the perspectives to the table. And so that can't happen in an uh, institute that focuses on a very narrow area of science. That has its, its place uh, for discovery and that sort of thing. But we also need to create, I'd love to see a research council. I'd love to see a different way of engaging students at the undergraduate level early on, not waiting till they're master's yeah. students or doctoral students, but first year students, second year students, working in close collaboration, where people in business who are involved in some of the experiences and building companies based on, say, science or based on human behavior or based on computer graphics, yeah. which draws in uh, from the arts, for example, or your humanists that think about the impact on the human experience for so much of the technology that we 
use? Is AI sentient? Well, I want my philosophers at the table yes, yeah. uh, uh, when we talk about that sort of thing. So creating spaces where we can bring different combinations of people together to really think about the, the, the problem. Yeah. And, and I think that's where uh, we're in a transition here in Armenia. A lot of awareness that we have to find ways to do it, but what that looks like, I think, still has to emerge. Mm-hmm. Science, I think, is increasingly interdisciplinary. It likely always has been. We're just noticing it more now. And so is technology growingly becoming more and more interdisciplinary. And there's a lot of issues on how these technologies and these new discoveries in science are impacting society. And I often worry that without developing our social sciences and our humanities, the Armenian voice is sort of being left out of the table when discussing what type of technologies we want to have in society and what we want that impact to be. So I, I really agree that it's super important to develop not just the natural and hard sciences, but also the, the social sciences and the humanities. What are some models that Armenia can look at from other emerging markets, developing economies, and how they've strengthened their their university ecosystems? Or is that a bad way of thinking about it? Well, no, I think it's the right question to ask. And I think there are different kinds of models. I, I of course, come out of the, the U.S. model, and I can speak best to that. What I do think we can do here, and, and I think it would be valuable as we develop, and it's important to develop strength in the foundational sciences. So I do I do think that's critical. It's important to develop fluency in, in the technologies and data analytics, which undergirds every field now. It's not just in technology, yeah. but it's in everything we do. So it's important to have that level of fluency. It's important to be able to bring the different teams together. And I think one of the things that universities can do, and certainly university leadership, um, you started with that question from my perspective as a university leader. We tried to create opportunities through centers and institutes, through cluster hiring, not just in a particular field of, say, engineering or in computer science uh, or in biological science, marine science, but also bringing the public policy people to the table, bringing the you know the the people in the arts. If you're talking environmental studies, for example. That's a key issue for Armenia. Armenia has something to say about that with its biodiversity, with its interest in in thinking about renewable energy for the future. Um, This is something that, that we all have to care about and I think Armenia can play a role in it. And certainly that's starting to happen. There are some programs uh, at the university for that. Um, but what impact does that have in terms of how we develop public policy, for right. example? Are those policymakers at the table? What about our, our, our artists and our literature um, you know, voices? Well, there's a great deal of writing about the impact of climate change, for example, uh, on, uh, in creating a dystopia. How do we imagine that? This is where our imaginative... Uh, and creative writers can help us see some things in ways that perhaps um, you know we don't see when we just look at the pure science. And so I think deciding as a as a community here in Armenia, what are our goals? Mm-hmm. What are the main areas we want to strengthen? And how do we create spaces? It doesn't mean we dismantle what we have. I think that's the key here. And there may be a fear that that's what what some people are saying. I don't actually say that. But I think it's creating the spaces where we incentivize collaborative work because the best thinking now is collaborative. And I refer a lot to a study that Google did a number of years ago. They called it Project Aristotle you know, the great philosopher. And it was really looking at what were their most innovative teams to solve some of the more complex problems. Mm -hmm. And they found that it wasn't the teams of these very high-powered, very smart engineers, though they had tremendously good ideas, but it was the teams that brought all the disciplines together. Mm -hmm. The humanists are particularly good at listening right? And each hearing each other and trying to find those connections and connecting the dots is a really important piece. You need to have broad thinking. And uh, some people talk about the T model, right? The breadth and the depth. Um, There's some version of that, and our structures have to support and incentivize, I think, that kind of approach. Mm, That's a really great way to put it. Yeah, I think another area that would be really important for Armenia in terms of the next phase of its development would be really strategic investment uh, in in faculty and research uh, that 
you know, we, it's hard to bring uh, an individual here and say, now build this program. Um, what we found, and, and, and certainly I invested in it at San Jose State, were what we call cluster hires. So we would have an area uh, that was interdisciplinary by, by its nature that we wanted to really become known for. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, authorized five to seven faculty lines in that area um, several uh, in several departments to really uh, bring the expertise together so that we can first they reinforce each other they create a bonding so people aren't alone by themselves and it creates an energy and success and I think for Armenia to be thinking in terms of where are those areas that it wants to grow and be known and that's for Armenia to decide right it's not for me or anybody from the outside to, to say what that should be how do we and and I know um, uh, Professor Naira Hovagimian has been talking about this in the area of autonomous systems right. and the like well how do you do that well you can bring if you bring five or six or eight scholars, uh, young scholars, young researchers from uh, around the world, from the diaspora here, at the same time, suddenly you have a research group that can do some really amazing work because now they're working together. Right. And I think this, this idea of strategic investment um, in the areas that Armenia wants to be known can have a real impact mm -hmm. in terms of building that level of excellence uh, and knowledge uh, and impact. Can you speak a little bit about how people or the country really should go about choosing those directions? What what makes something strategically important for Armenia? Well, that's a uh, I mean, Ar Ar that's a question for Armenia and and but for just those how to approach it, those here. I, I think you know Armenia has its goals in terms of how it wants to position itself, what its needs are, whether they're uh, security needs, whether there's needs in terms of of the environment, for right. example, whether there's needs in terms of the education system. Uh, or, or the business side or healthcare, for example, which could be another area. Where does it want to have real uh, strength, right. for example, in its region? Let's say it's healthcare, right? And it wants to build a, a different kind of healthcare system that can really ensure the wellness of the population. Mm -hmm. Then you think strategically about how you do that. How do you educate your medical professionals? Can we build the nursing staff? Yeah. Because we never really had that. Yeah. We have nurses, but we, but we, there's a lot missing. And healthcare and healthcare policy and public health is something that Armenia has been thinking about and doing some work on. But if this is an area, and I'm not saying it should be, but if this is an area that Armenia decides it wants to be known for in the region and um, be a center for, then you invest strategically in what that looks like. And multiple institutions would need to be a part of that. And it would, it would partner with the Ministry of Health or, or what have you. And I think that's the question really for Armenia policymakers um, and for the society here to, to really um, to speak to where are those most critical needs. Right. And then how do we build the knowledge base and the, uh, so that we can impact the results? Mm -hmm. Do you also balance those directions that you choose between, one, what are your needs for your country specifically based on the industries that already exist here? but also directions that might have a really long-term payoff. For instance, another guest earlier was saying that Boston began investing in biotech in the 60s, probably long before anybody knew that would be such a big uh, and important technology. How do you balance those two? Or smaller countries like Armenia not have the luxury of that? Well, I think smaller countries actually um, can make some choices like that. There are certainly the local needs. What, what do we need to be a strong country, to be a safe country, to be a thriving country, yeah. right, to, to have impact in the space in which we live? I think that's an important piece. We, we, we start there. Because if we can't protect our home, it, right. it doesn't matter what else we do, right? right? But there is a global um, question as well, and Armenia has human resources. It has excellence in that. And so I'll, I'll take a, you know, you can look at societies like um, Singapore, for example, or Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is the chip maker of the world. It's a small place, but right. they design, right, the, the, the top-notch chips. So what is it that Armenia wants to be known for? Right. So you, you have to find, I think my suggestion would be to find the balance between the two. We want to be seen with excellence, and if, if there is a question in the world around something, right. let's say it's an AI, let's say, I mean, you choose the item, whatever it is, it's not for me yeah. to do. And, and you say, if, if you want to build that, the best people are in Armenia. That's where you go. 
right? right? That connects Armenia to the world. At the same time, though, you have to build what you need right. to ensure that Armenia has an environment where those kinds of things can happen, right. where the society can thrive, where people stay, yeah. right? And um, what we want to want to have is a vibrant uh, community here in Armenia that continues. Yeah. Uh, and, and so finding that balance between the two. But absolutely, I think, and that's where a small country can't be everything. Mm-hmm. It has to, you know, really think about what one or two or possibly three areas does it really want to be known for. And that's where the Taiwan example is so interesting because by becoming so dominant in the chip manufacturing space, they've become such an important global global player in a globally important country that people pay attention to them and take them seriously. So it seems like one direction, with one direction you take care of your needs at home, and then with another direction you become a global player, you become globally important. Yeah, and when you're globally important, people want to make sure that you are protected That's and right. you are, they have an interest in you in a, a different r- kind of way. R- ripple effect, yeah. That's right. So we're here at the Science and Technology Convergence Conference today, and there's a lot of uh, professionals, academics, scientists from the diaspora here, and there's a lot of people from the local community, from locally from Yerevan here as well. And over the years at this conference, there has been some really successful collaborations that have resulted in companies and organizations and other uh, initiatives. Do you think there is some specific productive way that uh, academics and executives at universities in the diaspora can can work effectively with local Armenian universities to to help grow the develop the ecosystem? Well, I think the power of Armenia, honestly, um, is that it uh, it isn't just a country in the Caucasus. But it is a global nation. Yes. And so we have, and there's a great deal of discussion about what those partnerships can look like. What is the relationship between Armenia proper and its diaspora? And they all have their, they have their characteristics. The diaspora is not monolithic. Right. Um, it, it's, it has distinct characteristics depending on, on where it is. Right. Uh, but I think that's our power, honestly. And I think uh, it's important to figure out what that looks like. Mm-hmm. And um, we can build excellence in Armenia. We have, you know, great minds here, uh, but we also have great experience because of the the level of expertise uh, in the diaspora. And if you think about the numbers, if you've got maybe three million at best here, and you've got ten million altogether, that's that's almost double outside of Armenia. Yeah. And so coming, I, I think this is one of the exciting things about where we find ourselves today is that we are living in a global period mm-hmm. and uh, Armenia has a window to the global market right. in part because it has a diaspora. Right. And it makes it much easier because there's always ways to build those partnerships. But I think we have to do it out of mutual respect. Right. I think we have to understand that um, we have different experiences. We bring different maybe um, uh, issues and perspectives to the table and what can we learn together and, uh, and support each other so that there's growth and that the entire Armenian nation benefits. Right, yes. Well, there's a network, I think, um, and in any field in, in science, um, science is global, of course, but there are networks, and um, Armenia is a small country. So, you know, if it only lived within Armenia, there's, there's only, everybody here knows each other, right? The only way you grow is by growing your network, and that's a natural way to start those contacts. Now, that may lead to connections with, with non-Armenians because of the nature of the field. Which is even better, because then we multiply the network. Um, Our commitment has to be to excellence, and our commitment has to be to a world-class level. Uh, Armenia is fully capable of doing that, and I think we have to challenge each other in a in a positive way uh, to reach that level. Um, the, the 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 world is a very competitive place, and Armenians know that well. We have competed uh, in all kinds of fields, mm-hmm. and have often been very successful at it. We should share with each other uh, and ensure we're not in competition with each other. I, I, I mentioned uh, in my talk yesterday, uh, you may have picked it up, we don't need unhealthy competition. Healthy competition is another matter because sure. that pushes us to improve. Mm-hmm. It, it makes sure that we don't just um, you know sit back and get comfortable. Uh, because the world is constantly changing around yes. us. But we need to do it in a way that's that's actually helping each other grow. And we learn from each other. Yeah. And I think that's what I see happening here. 
Uh, that's the spirit I feel um, in the conversations that I've had and that I've been a part of. And, and I think these are exactly the kinds of um, convergences, if you will, that we need to we need to continue to have. Right. So another thing when looking at the Armenian higher education system, uh, one thing that's noticeable is that the major universities are all concentrated in Yegevan. Um, but when you look at a country like the U.S., a lot of really great uh, universities are in much smaller cities outside of the major cities, and they're not so concentrated. Uh, and I'm sure that's super impactful to their local economies and ecosystems. When you look at the Armenian higher education system, what do you think about the fact that they're all concentrated in Yegevan? And should there be an effort to expand some of those universities or potentially even move them to the regions of Armenia? Or is it okay that they're all here? Well, Armenia, it's not unusual. We're seeing it in the United States as well, where the population is growing in the cities and is thinning out to some degree in the rural areas. And so we see this in the United States uh, and we see it in Armenia. It's understandable because there's the, the resources are here. And so people are together. It creates that synergy. Uh, but the truth is, it, we can't become a country that is just yet, Ivan. Of course. And there's, there is great talent everywhere. Uh, talent is everywhere. It's opportunity and the development of that talent that, that we have to feel a responsibility toward. And there are different models that one can use. I think, um, you know, it's really great, for example, to see some of the work that's being done, for example, in Gumri, which has become a second technology center yes. and a space of innovation. Really great work in the north that's going to be a, a second center, if you will, that can speak to that region. Yeah. And I think there are ways to do it. It's hard to relocate a whole university. So I, I don't know that that's the model exactly. But I do think, and I know some of the universities are, are thinking about that. I, I, I believe AUA has done it. And I, I'm not familiar with what what um, some of the others like Yerevan State or, or Polytechnic or others. But I think it is good to have regional centers uh, to think about how to expand the reach. Um, we have a system in the United States, of course, of community colleges. Mm -hmm. These are the first two years of, of university, but they also have a lot of technical kinds of right. programs that fit the local economies. Right. And um, even in spaces where you don't have access to a four-year institution, you have access usually to a two-year institution. I don't know that that model exists in Armenia, and I'm not saying that's what it should be, but I do think we need to think about how to, to take education out into mm -hmm. all the regions in Armenia. And, and again, I know that is happening right. to some degree, but the probability is that to advance, uh, just because of the landscape and, the, and, and the, the size of the country and all of that, it's probably still going to have this concentration in here in Yerevan. Which I imagine is normal for a small country, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And just coming to our last question, Dr. Papazian, um, let's say we're, we're looking at the future in the coming 5, 10 years. What are some, some key indicators that you look for to see that Armenia's higher education system is moving in the right direction? Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, really thinking about some of these reforms. I think there's some basic questions. Um, there, uh, professors in, for example, in, in pre uh, um, independence in Soviet times had a certain status in society yeah. and, and they lived a decent life. I mean, it was a different, it was a different society. It was set up in a different way, a different economy. Um, but we, we have lost some of that. And so we've seen, uh, a, a brain drain. We, we really lost a lot of that, that kind of, that population of expertise in the nineties, for example, I call it the missing generation. And, and I think, you know, that's something that we still face here in Armenia is, is the loss of that generation. Uh, but so we need to find ways to support the university so that those who teach in them and work in them have a living wage. Right. So let's start there. And the same is true. You can take that down into the the education system, the K through 12, if you right. will, the pre-university education, where again, we need to support teachers. Right. I think that's critical. I do think they're, uh, you know, thinking about collaborations. The more we can see collaborations between universities, the development of this teacher-scholar model, so that that can engage students, these will be good indicators, I think, of, of engagement and success for Armenia's higher education going forward. So I think that's going to be important. Uh, I, I, I also think that there are new technologies that can connect Armenia, it already does, with the world. We, we learned when we had COVID, when everybody went into online education, that there are ways to access 
information and experiences, even if you're not in the same place. So I expect that as particularly in some of the cutting edge areas in, in, um, in technology and education and engineering, that there will be partnerships. We may have instructors teaching from Silicon Valley, for example, courses here in Armenia right. in some of the, you know, in, like yeah, it could be in AI, of course, though there are experts here. Uh, it could be in blockchain. It could be in, in some of the immersive technologies that are, uh, that it's the rage now, right? That everybody's building this metaverse. Right. Um, it has some interesting potential, actually. Um, and, and seeing where the enhancement of uh, support for researchers, uh, for seeing the kinds of publications, uh, the rising. I, I'm not a big fan of rankings, but it is important to be part of that global entity. And it would be great to be able to see Armenia's universities have, have be known for, for certain things, right. right? Maybe have areas of expertise um, and be a center, f- a regional center for um, students from outside of Armenia, but from the region. Uh, because I think it has the potential to do that. And that anchors it, um, I think, with more diversity of thought um, and more potential, I think, to connect with the global world. Dr. Papazian, I personally learned a lot from this conversation. I hope you'll join us again in the future to, to dive even deeper into some of these stories. Thank you so much for being with us. Today. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.